My range is out of action. Go and look again. They're awful. <laughs> Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today is a first for me. And, well, it's a response film. And part of the reason for that, look at this. As you can tell, my range is out of action. So, it's going to be a little bit talky in the space that I've got here. But it's also a very interesting subject. So it's responding to Matt's latest film, which is The Problem with Medieval Swords. Effectively, what he's looking at and what he's saying is that a lot of modern sword collectors, they fetishise certain aspects of swords. So they buy a sword, and this is in the context of the work that he's doing with Royal Armouries and Windlass. But they buy a sword, and they look at it and they go, oh, the blade's not symmetrical or the guard's not symmetrical or some of the lines aren't quite crisp or there's a little bit of a scratch here or the fit in the guard is bad. And therefore, everything, everything is appalling about that sword. And Matt's saying, well, hang on a minute. Let's look at museums. Let's look at the things which are actually out there and what we're trying to achieve with this replica. And then let's talk about that and put... Put it in context, put it in the context, <laughs> Matt's word, put it in the context of what you're buying and what you're trying to buy. Are you trying to buy the world's best, most perfect ever sword? Or are you trying to buy something which is representative of what was really out there? And there is a fine line to tread between really the very roughness, and we're going to go into this, of a lot of medieval work, and the super crispness that is expected of modern buyers when they spend $1,500, 1500 euros, pounds, whatever, on a sword. What are they going to get? Because some of the stuff that was out there in the medieval times would never, ever find a market now. But it was good enough for them. So let's start this journey. I actually made a film about this about three or four years ago, and there's a link in the notes to it, where it's, it's almost exactly this, which is reproduction or medieval, which is better. But it's such an interesting subject, you know, and Matt's brought up other points as well, the things that I didn't mention, that I think it's worth going and, and having a look at it. But have a look at that old film as well. It's good, and I'm going to pull some bits of that into here. So the first question you have to ask is, are you looking for perfection? Because we all know, of course, that medieval craftsmen, they, they loved their craft, they... They cherished it, they cherished their status that it gave them and everything about it and they never made anything other than just beautiful objects. You can see that in every museum. Cod's wallet. Absolute rubbish. Go and look again. Go and look again. Now, right from the start, I can tell you there are some things that I want perfection in. I want perfection in the quality of my car's brakes. I don't want perfection in my medieval swords. And I don't care how much money I spend on it. I make my own as well, of course, but, you know, I buy other people's too. But I don't care. I don't want perfection because the moment I get it, it is, by definition, not perfect. Well, what do I mean by that? It sounds really stupid that it doesn't matter how much money I spend on a sword, I don't want it to be perfect. Well, it's like, God, Todd's gone crazy. But I haven't. I really haven't. Because there's a catch-22 here. Pieces made in medieval times, and I don't care how much money was involved, were not perfect. They just weren't. They really weren't. Any example you can think of now, you're screaming at the, at the TV, the computer screen, you're going, Todd, what about this? What about that? Well, you know what? Go and look at those pictures again. Go and check for asymmetry. Go and check for things not being quite straight. Lines wondering. Because I can tell you, whatever you are thinking about, it is not perfect. So by the very definition of me wanting a sword which is perfect, I've ended up with something that never was. Something that would be out of place in, in medieval England, Europe. And if it's out of place then it's not perfect. So, literally, looking for perfection makes it non-perfect. It's, it's just a, a circle of, I don't know, a logic implosion. Catch-22. That's why I don't want perfect. Now, here is a good example of what I mean by that, and it's actually a little sequence that I'm going to take out of my earlier film. And it's of the Writhen Hilt Sword and the Leeds Armouries. It is a beautiful, it is an iconic piece. It is perfection of that kind of thing. But just watch this. So if we just come back now to this long sword hilt, have a look at this. So here you can see, quite clearly see the, um, the gilding breaking away. Well, that's fine. But if we come back to the guard here, you can see you've got a great big casting floor there. You've got more casting floors here and here. S quite a lot of pitting there, which must be casting floors again. And again here, there's definitely fireworks, firework which is completely visible, and the same in the blade as well. 
Now here's a little hint. Have a look at the asymmetry of that blade grind. It's not looking great. Shoulders are diving in towards the guard here. It's a bit of a messy job, frankly. Now, this is part of what I want to show you here today. So you look at this sword, my reproduction. I make it crisp. I don't make it perfect. I don't make it perfect. I don't make it sterile. I make it look like a person has made it. But I'm going to turn this over now. And let's have a look at this. I've put a series of numbers on the blade here. And they are measured off the original. And they're the distance from the edge to the central spine. All right? 15 mil, 15 mil. So at this point, the blade is actually even. Here, 10.8 millimeters, 14.6. 10.8 from there to there, 14.6 from the edge to the center at that point on the original. 13, 9.2, 7. The original blade on this sword was a total mess. I couldn't make a sword like that. I don't think I could make a sword like that, but I couldn't make a sword like that and sell it. It would be an unsaleable item. Now you can see from this that the castings were just absolutely full of flaws. None of them bad enough that either the maker or the buyer had a problem with it. The blade was laughably off center, absolutely appalling. Was it the subject of uh, a sharpening afterwards? Impact damage, something like that? Possibly, but actually I don't think so. I really don't because I looked for that when I examined the original sword. So I don't think that's the case either. It's just the way it was. And you can look at this across anything. Now look at this picture of bollock dagger handles from the Mary Rose book. Now obviously they're not swords, but it's nice because I've got a whole rack of them all side by side. Pick any one of those, pause the screen now. Pick any one of those and measure. Look at it, look for asymmetry, look for the straightness. Look at how bad the tang holes are. It's awful, they're awful, but they're also fabulous. So this is the funny thing. I'm used to looking, Matt's used to looking at pieces in museums and handling them. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But go and look at pictures if you can't get to the museums. But next time, really look. Look for asymmetry, look for bad fitting, look for scratches and strike marks, hammer marks. Look for bits of old scale that's left on, braise that has been left in, in joints that was too difficult to file out. You will find it all. You will find every defect that you can possibly think of on all of those beautiful me medieval museum examples. It's all there. It's all there. But they also share something in common because they're not all bad. It's, it, you know, it sounds like I'm just saying that everything that is in museums is awful and they couldn't make anything and it was dreadful. That is not the case. They excelled in one thing, functionality. To us, if a handle you know, falls off, well, yeah, it's an inconvenience. It's not great. It could possibly hurt somebody. To them, a handle falls off, well, that's big news in the middle of a fight. So the thing is, functionality was what they pursued above everything else. And the fact that the blade might be a little bit wobbly on its lines, it doesn't matter a jot. It makes no difference for that sword fight. It is absolutely fine to somebody back then, but not necessarily so to somebody now. I mean, I couldn't make a sword uh, saw blade as badly as that Ryven Hilt one in the Royal Armouries and expect anybody to want it. It's appalling. So this comes into a really a difficult area for me because I'm always saying to you that they wanted these items for show. It's all about, you wear your wealth. It's all about what people think. It's about how you use them. It's about how they work. It's about functionality. But part of that functionality as well to be honest, is about looking cool, looking wealthy, looking better than your other people around you. So the thing is, the only conclusion you can come to is that they just didn't care. They just didn't care. I mean, there's another clip now uh, of another film of mine where I made a replica from the Wallace collection. Look at Toby Campbell and myself discussing the hilt on this. The work was awful, but take it away. This one, when you come up close to it, it's rough. Mm -hmm. It's rough as you like, mm -hmm. and particularly actually on the other side, um, if I remember rightly, you know, it, it's yeah. so crudely done, mm -hmm. so crudely done, mm -hmm. and it, it, it almost makes you wonder if it was sort of like hurried through the workshop because he had to go and have a fight the next day or something like that. <laughs> um, and that was an interesting 
thing for me because, of course, I want to capture the spirit of something. So actually, if I'd got my verniers out and I'd made that completely symmetrical and, um, you know, it, it was just super, super precise, you, you start to get the sterility of something rather than the life of it. And so it was a real fudge between... I, I, I couldn't sell that. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody would want that. Mm -hmm. um, not in this day and age. But, um, but equally, I've... I've not been super precise about it either, because it needs that. It does. For me, it's, I think it needs that. It's to be a, an organic object. Mm, mm. So you see, even expensive high-status objects like that, which it was, have, to us, appalling levels of craftsmanship on it. But it's funny, because we have this way of looking back at the past, at medieval life, of some sort of wonderful utopia of craftspeople making the most beautiful objects, and that's all they ever did. And it just wasn't that way. You know, we keep on saying, oh, they don't make it like they used to. Oh, it's better back in the day. And, oh, people don't know how to do it right these days. Well, they do. <laughs> they really do. So the question is, why did they do it? Well, I think it's quite a simple thing, which is, if something's seen and it looks good, and that's fine, nobody's going to come and pick up your sword and examine it like this, like I do, peering over my glasses and having a look and go, oh, there's a bit of a scratch there. Nobody's going to do that. Right? They're going to see it when it's been swung around. They're going to see it when it's on your hip and you're looking cool. Right? That's where they're going to see it. And they're not going to go peering. So if it's a bit ropey, it doesn't matter. But the craftsman, nothing has changed. I've got bills to pay. He's got bills to pay. He's wondering how he's going to settle his bills at the end of the week or whatever it is. He cracks it out. He does it. Fast. Do it faster. Do it faster. Get more. Done. Will it fall apart? Well, that will get you a customer complaint. A little bit of roughness around the edges. Nobody seemed to care. So Matt brought up another interesting point about the fit and finish of guards and pommels on swords. Uh, he didn't actually talk about grips, but I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Now, clearly some pieces were made back in the day where a great deal of care was taken over the fit and finish of the piece. Most things weren't like that, actually. They really weren't. And so you can go and look at museum examples, again, as Matt says, which are so wobbly, and it's not the archaeology, it's not that the tang has rusted away or the hole through the guard has rusted away. They were just awful from the beginning. And this aspect has absolutely fascinated me now, because if you go to any sword forum, my armoury, SGB, whatever, one of the things that people hate above anything else is a rattle on the grip, a rattle on the guard, rattle on the grip, squeaks, things which are loose, distracts you. Well... They used to often buy blades from here, buy guards and pommels from there. They'd arrive to the cutler because the cutler doesn't make it, don't forget. The cutler just assembles and they'd arrive and he'd go, yeah, it kind of fits on there. Yeah, it's lovely. Great, brilliant. Put it together. Oh, it doesn't quite fit. Hammer in a wedge. Copper, bronze, doesn't really matter. Bit of lead, bit of pitch, put it all together. Peen it down. Yeah, it's all right. Awful, 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 awful way of putting swords together. Really was. And so the thing is, what you end up with is a sword that the guard literally may have had a wedge, wedge of lead hammered in to keep it tight. You buy it, guard's tight. You hit it once on the pell on, a, on a, a log or something like that, and the guard will rattle. You strike the guard with another blow, you know, the first sword fight you had that evening, whatever it is, the guard will rattle, right? Even if that doesn't happen and it's well fitted, it's the handle which slides down and, and holds the guard in place. Well, that wood, it's got a long leverage if you've got a guard like this and the, the handle is that wide at that point. Long leverage. It will loosen. So the bottom line is medieval swords often, literally from the moment you bought them, would rattle. It's evident from the way they're put together. People didn't care. People just didn't care. So then you come down to actually the materials as well. So they'd bodge stuff together with all sorts of stuff to make it fit. And um, your oak shop, for instance, has got a sword he took apart where he found wooden wedges in the grip um, and, the, and the guard there to hold it all together. But then also the materials. So I think it was Alan Williams, but he looked at blade hardnesses on one particular sword blade and it went, I'm working from memory here, but it went from 30 Rockwell, which is soft, all the way through to 60, which is darn hard, on the same sword blade. Now, when you're polishing and cleaning that, you are never going to be able to get that smooth and flat. It's not going to happen. Because, you know, here, your, your wheel is eating in like a good one, and there, it's not eating in at all. It's just skating over the surface, pretty much. So you will never get that good. You just won't. But they didn't seem to care anyway. 
And so the thing is, you know, Matt, what Matt was saying, well, these blades, some of the blades he was talking about, have got ripples and um, wobbles in them. Well, that is an artifact of working on wheels, particularly in that orientation, particularly in that. But also if you're going across as well, if you're doing a bit of rough grinding, we take that sort of thing out now in modern manufacture with flat platens on belt linishes and things like that. We can get flat, truly flat blades easily. They just couldn't. But the thing is, when you stack up a little bit of a wobble in the blade with all of the other things I've been talking about, why would they care? I mean, again, if you go and measure museum examples, it is really common, and I mean really common, to, to start at the hilt and you start measuring the blade thickness as you're going down. You go, oh, oh, it's gone up a little bit. Oh, oh, up a bit, yeah, yeah. It does that. They go up and down. They, they might be going down towards a point, but that is not uniform. They literally will go up. And so all of these things are there in real medieval pieces. So this is where we come back really to why I want things which aren't perfect. So a modern made sword will exceed a medieval made sword in every single way. In quality materials, in symmetry, in dimensions, in tightness, in fit, in, in the way it all goes together, the way it doesn't loosen off. All of those things. But it fails in one. And that is, often, they just don't look medieval. They just don't. Now, the thing is, if you look at a, a landscape, loads of fields out there, right? You will spot the power line. You will spot the wall or the road because it's straight. It's not natural. It's, it's alien to what you're seeing. And the same is true with something like symmetry. You don't find true, perf perfect, flawless symmetry out in nature, or barely never. And so when you see it, it, it's like it's got a neon sign. Your eye is attracted to it and you go, oh, something not right there. Even if you can't put your finger on it, it's not right. And it's not right because it's not been made by a person. And subconsciously, and I'm a great believer in the subconscious because I work a lot with film, and that's really important for that. But it's also true for doing replicas because subconsciously, if you hit perfection, it's not perfect. You can see it, it's not right. You can feel it. And so for me, things are too good and they become soulless. I, I, I become disinterested. I want to see the maker. I want to see the maker there. I want to, I want to read the way he's written. You know, it's the signature of his, his, of his hammer strokes, of his file marks, just the way he's chosen to do things and not. And you get that. You get that in a handmade piece, but not if it's perfect. So as somebody who recreates medieval weapons, I have to find the middle ground. I have to find the middle ground between truly medieval, which is in a modern sense awful, really. Not when somebody picks it out of the box and has a good close look at it. I couldn't do it. Anything I could make would be better than pretty much anything in a museum in terms of fit and finish and, and cleanliness and lines and everything. That's, that's the way it is. I'm not bigging myself up, it's just the way it is. So you have to find the essence of the piece and make it into something that is acceptable for a modern person, but not lose the soul of what there was. Now, sometimes you can do that quite easily, quite straightforwardly. Other times you have to make a decision and you go, I don't really care what a modern person wants. This is what I want. This is what works for me. Take it, don't take it. But this is what I'm doing. And hopefully I've hit the line on that with my budget range with Todd Cutler. But also when it comes to items that I craft under Todd's workshop where I, I'm hand making everything myself. Some pieces it's, it's easy to extract the essence. Sometimes it's harder. Sometimes I just don't want to. Because if I try and make what the modern market wants, the essence of it, or at least my view of it, has gone. So take this piece here. This is a Scottish dirk that I'm working on, right? A bit of carving there, nice piece mid 17th century, 12 inch, 30 centimeter blade. It's nice. What does the modern market want? Well, the modern market, obviously they're seeing a knife grip here, yeah? So the modern market wants you to take your hand, which is about eight and a half, nine centimeters wide, roughly for most kind of people, and put it on this grip here. Doesn't fit, because that's only six centimeters. So the thing is the grip is not that, it's that. That's what it is, right? Now, I could change this and I could make that bigger because the modern market now wants it and you can fit your hand on it and everybody's happy and it's brilliant. But then it doesn't become a dirk anymore. It's just dirkish. 
right? I don't want to make dirkish things, I want to make dirks. And so the essence of this, I might change little details because I don't like it, but for me, part of the essence of this is the size of it. You change the size of it and you lose the soul of it. It just immediately becomes silly, the proportions are wrong. So sometimes you can deal with it, sometimes you can't. So, you know, in the modern world, I'm sorry, dirks are this size, they were always this size. For me, they will be this size. That's just the way it is. So there you have my wet day rant, really. Basically, in a nutshell, medieval stuff was awfully made. So if you want perfection, that's great. But if you truly want a medieval replica, well, maybe you can actually go and get something which is truly, truly awful. I've done it before. I've, I have been requested to make things for people deliberately badly, to, to make them when it looks like I'm leglessly drunk. That was a request, genuinely. So these things are possible. Most people don't want that. So you find the in-betweener. But actually, for me, long way of saying it, but as soon as you get perfection, you've lost soul. You've lost soul, you have lost the entire medieval period. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>